And hello to anybody who's started uh, joining us for this conversation. Um, hi, my name is Julia. I'm from the Playwright Center. Glad to have you here. We are going to be uh, starting at seven o'clock, so in about 13 minutes. Um, so you're in the right place. You can just grab a grab a glass of water and then you'll be good to go. We are not going to see or hear any of you, um, but if you do uh, drop a comment on uh, Playwright Center's Facebook or HowlRound's Facebook, then uh, we will see those. Thank you so much. And hi, everybody joining us on the Playwright Center page, the HowlRound page, or on Facebook. You're in the right place for our conversation tonight. We'll be starting in about 10 minutes at 7 o'clock. Um, so you are where you need to be, um, but you can take a little break before we get started. We are not going to see or hear any of you, but if you can hear me and you can see our slide, uh, then you are going to be able to see and hear our panelists just fine.
Hello, good evening to everybody who's signed on. Um, you are in the right place for our conversation this evening. Whether you're on the HowlRound page, the Playwright Center page, or on Facebook, we're glad to have you. Uh, you will not be seen or heard. We are just going to be streaming out. But if you can hear my voice and see this standby slide, then you are all set and have everything you need to watch the conversation. Hello, good evening to everybody who's signed on. Um, you are in the right place for our conversation. And hi, everyone. Good to see some names popping up. I think Facebook only lets me see a couple people's names, so I can't greet all of you, but hi, Barb and Crystal and Janet and Candris. Good to see you all and everybody else, um, whether you're on the Playwright Center page, the HowlRound page, or on Facebook. We're glad to have you. You are in the right place for tonight's conversation. We'll start in about four minutes um, at seven o'clock. Uh, you won't be seen or heard. Um, so we're just streaming out to you, but if you can hear my voice and see our standby slide, then you have everything you need to watch the conversation.
And hi, everybody. I'll do my little spiel one more time. Um, you are in the right place to join us for tonight's conversation, whether you are on the Playwright Center page, the HowlRound page, uh, or on Facebook. We're very glad to see you here. We'll be starting in just about a minute at seven. Um, so uh, we will not be seeing or hearing any of you. This is just a stream, but you can also uh, comment in the Facebook with um, questions, which we'll talk about later. Um, but that's kind of our way that we get to engage with you. Like to see the likes coming in. Thank you so much. Hey, Shannon. I wanna just turn off your video just for the moment before we get started. And in just a minute, I'll turn it over to Jeremy. Hello, hello, everyone. How are you all? I wish I could be with you in person uh, and uh, see you all and connect with you all and give you a hug. I, I miss everyone so much. Uh, it's lovely to have you with us tonight. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and welcome to the Playwright Center or a version of it online, uh, at least for the moment. Uh, my name is Jeremy Cohen. I use he, him pronouns, uh, and I am the producing artistic director here at the Playwright Center. Uh, and on behalf of our board and staff, and now the over 2,200 playwrights uh, we support each year, I'm so pleased to welcome you to the first conversation of our summer series, Black Made That. We have folks tuning in online as we've been able to hear and see from all over the globe uh, to be with us tonight. Um, so just on behalf of everyone in, in Minnesota and the Twin Cities and certainly at the Playwright Center, um, we are just sending you much love and health right now. Wear a mask. Uh, and um, in the middle of this moment of justice and activism, art making and transformation, we are gathering together this summer at the Playwright Center to hear from an extraordinary set of artists. For us at the center, we are an artist service organization. And so we think of the artists that we exist to serve as the leaders in many, many ways. So we value the centering of what we think of as artistic leadership and really artist leadership and how we make our decisions and how we think about our programming and I can't think of a better artist to guide this moment uh, with us and for us, alongside us and in front of us than the extraordinary Shay Cage and this amazing group of artists that you'll get to spend time with tonight. Uh, coming up at the Player Center, we have uh, in the summer series, three other amazing conversations during July and August. The next one is on Tuesday, July 28th at 7 p.m. Central uh, and focuses on transforming artistic relationships, looking at new models of partnership between playwrights and theaters and how we change some broken systems going forward. This discussion includes brilliant playwrights, Pearl Clegg, oh my God, and Harrison David Rivers and Vera Starbard, as well as artistic leaders like Alyssa Adams and Leslie Ishii from Perseverance Theater. Details on this and all of our conversation can be found at pwcenter.org. I wanna thank our incredible partners at HowlRound TV for live streaming tonight's conversation, as well as the three others in this summer series. These live streams are being produced for the HowlRound Theater Commons, an incredible, incredible, um, Commons, an incredible place for discussion and discourse, especially right now. I also want to send a special thank out to our supporting sponsor for this series, Knock Inc., whose underwriting has helped bring tonight's conversation to you free of charge while ensuring that we can, of course, always pay artists for their time and for their work. Uh, tonight's discussion will be approximately about 75 minutes long. Um, there will be a Q&A section in the middle of the conversation. So when Shay gives you the word, around 7.45 or so, you can send your questions uh, to Shay uh, and the cohort in one of two ways. You can email us at questions at pwcenter.org, 
or if you're viewing this live on Facebook, um, post your question in the comment section there and we'll be able to get it and direct it back to Shay there. And again, that email uh, one more time is questions at pwcenter.org. When I moved here 10 years ago, Shay Cage was one of the first artists I met in town. And I have reflected on that moment as one of my tr first true knowings and understandings of the Twin Cities and how it was going to become a home for me. Shay is a writer, an activist, a theater and film performer, a director, raised in Mississippi and living in Minnesota for a while now, and who has been called a change maker, one of the leading artists of her generation, a mover and a maker. Her poetry has been featured in several publications, including Blues Vision, the St. Paul Almanac, and the Family Housing Fund's Home Series. Her plays include five solo works and a number of other pieces, including a forthcoming commission about human trafficking. She holds both Emmy and Ivy Awards, a McKnight Theater Artist Fellowship, a TCG Fellowship, five Artists of the Year recognitions, and international awards for film features. She was a co-founder and co-writer of five plays with Mama Mosaic Theater, and has been using art to elevate black and brown narratives through true roots for over 20 years. And just recently, and what has brought us together tonight, Shay led and launched the incredible A Moment of Silence, a living historical archive and celebration of blackness launched through the commissioning of over 50 black Minnesotan voices during this moment of transformation. And you can find the anthology online at blackmnvoices.com. That's blackmnvoices.com. This project is one of the primary catalysts for bringing us together tonight. So please, 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 if you haven't seen the work of these incredible artists and Shay's vision, please log on and check it out. Again, uh, blackmnvoices.com. Read the essays, listen, reflect, and share out the work of these amazing artists who are based here in Minnesota. I could go on all night about this incredible project, but rather than do that, much more importantly, Please help me welcome to the screen, the one and only, Shay Cage. Hey. <laughs> Love you, have fun. Love you too, thank you, Jeremy. Um, I'm just so tickled and excited to bring these amazing artists on. So um, I'm just gonna ask uh, Shannon Gibney, Danez, and Jacoby Johnson to, um, to open up your uh, your screen so that we can see your beautiful faces. Um, I am just thrilled to have some audience, even though we can't see y'all, we can feel y'all. Um, so we just give you our energy and our love. Um, Shannon, where you at? We can't um, I think somebody made it impossible for me to turn, uh -oh. up, turn on my, um, I keep on trying to and it says, okay. Okay, now. Hey, yay. <laughs> yeah. You know, black faces. Yeah. So I just, I, I mean, I um I love I love making black space. Yeah. And uh, I was telling the folks at the Playwright Center and these wonderful artists that have said yes to being here, knowing that they could be in a hundred other places of importance. Um no, we can't that, it's corona. <laughs> Well, what well, kind of, you can be outside. <laughs> so there are no rules right now. I mean, I know, you know, we can be formal, but I know that, but I just want to have fun. I feel like we, we're all caring a lot, uh, not just us, but the people in the audience. Uh, we've been through a lot in the last month, the last couple months, um, but there's just, I just can't even tell you guys how giddy I was waking up this morning um, for this. And there's been some heavy stuff on my heart lately, but this brings me great joy, not only to lift up a moment of silence, but um, it's just rare that you get these kind of spaces with artists that, you know, are so loved and appreciated already in the community. But I hardly, I hardly even get like five minutes with them. So now I got a whole hour and 15 minutes. So I would like to just frame the conversation briefly and get on in it. We are going to love on each other's pieces um, and just give each other love, love energy, love stares, <laughs> and um, frame it in the sense of Black made that. So my, I am a mother of two children, two Black brown boys, and um, we are often talking about the power of Black in our family ever since they were little. And, uh, and my brother, who's a pastor, he invited us to his church once and he showed this film 
that has never left these kids. And it was called Black Made That, but it was it was this like hip hop version of like everything you, you know, that you might use, but you didn't know that somebody black made it. And I just, it just really transformed sort of their concept of what they have been learning at home and sort of the reality of like our infinite possibilities. So everywhere we go, especially when we travel, I'm like, black made that. And they're like, mama, black made that. You know, they're using the ironing board today and they're like, black made this. So I just, I really want to uphold, you know, so that's where our title comes from for anybody that's like, why did they name it Black Made That? Um, I want to shout out Sarah Boone because the ironing board is something that we do use often. Um, and the ironing board as we know it um, is thanks to Miss Sarah Boone, a Black female. And also before security systems uh, became famous or known, uh, the African-American nurse Mary Van Britten Brown discovered or invented and patented the security system for her home, own home. She was somebody that lived in Queens, New York, and her husband was often working in a way. And she was like, she just, she came up with this, uh, this patent. And I just want to thank her for that as well. And there's a whole list of other inventions. And I just encourage anybody that's out there, particularly allies on the line, do some research, pull up some stuff, and teach these young ones and some old ones of some of the things and inventions, the mighty inventions that we use every day, and we don't give uh, praise and acknowledgement to Black folks. In particular, we have Black folks on the line who are makers and creators of literary works. So um, I have asked you guys to introduce yourself. How y'all feeling, first of all? How you feeling, Denez? Open up, can, do you guys have noise in your in your spaces? Can we open our mics just for a sec and just say hey? Hey. Hey. Hey, hey. Hey, y'all feeling good? Yeah? Yeah, I just had uh, dinner that I didn't have to cook and uh, my kids, you know, didn't, you know, throw everything on the floor. <laughs> and yeah, I'm, I'm great. I, mean, I get to be with you all and talk about the major issues of the day, uh, share in um, art. I'm, I'm, I'm very well. I'm very good. Fantastic. And you, Jacoby, you good? I'm good. I'm good. I have not had my dinner yet, but I'm going to have it after this. I made some homemade gnocchi, which I've never done before, and I'm very excited about it. So that's what's up. That's what's up, Denez. People are getting creative in their home spaces, just so mm -hmm. you know. How mm -hmm. you feeling? I'm feeling good, apparently. I wonder if it's Jacoby's for some gnocchi <laughs> later. Uh, that sounds about good. I just had me a can of Campbell's. It was kind of sad, but I spiked it up. I spiked it up. I love it. OK, so I. Um, so I, I've asked uh, each of you to introduce yourselves actually with a piece um, mm -hmm. so that um, I'm not spieling your bios um, at the top. And I love that. I just think sometimes when we get, get a chance to introduce ourselves with our own work, followed by however we want to formally introduce ourselves and maybe say, say a few things about what we feel most proud of. So however you, you all want to do that, um, I just wanted to start off by reading um, this small introduction that we have on uh, on our on the website. So for those that are listening in that haven't been to the website, um, we see the website. It's um, as a growing historical archive, and so its current state. You know, so you might have looked at it last week and it may have grown a little bit. And then two or three weeks from now, it'll continue to grow. And what I always um, am reminding people of in these weeks that we're still living and breathing uh, the new reality is that it's, we're not living in a past moment. Yeah, we're, we're right in it. We're still responding. Even at the memorial site, it continues to change. So I want to um, say George uh, Floyd's name. I want to center um, his spirit in this space and all of those that have uh, left our presence or been taken away much too soon. Um, and so I just want to read, um, I want to read the introduction and then I'm going to pass the mic um, to my comrades, starting with Shannon, uh, to bring in the, the strong literary work. Um, what a blessing to have uh, 55 plus um, black artists uh, as part of this project. 
uh, to uphold our own narratives, for us to be able to say, we ain't waiting on nobody, we putting it out there. For us to say black made that and it looked good and it feels fine and shiny and rough and rigid and just continues to be generative. So the if you go to that website, um, and you look at the first thing that you'll see is photos that are from the movement um, that different photographers have taken. Um, and then you will see, you'll scroll down and you'll see uh, an introduction from me and it reads, we are gathered here in this virtual space of blackness to speak our names, to breathe air into our narratives and acknowledge their rightful place in history and in this moment. The writers here are essential necessary culture bearers to the geography we call home, Minnesota. We look not to other establishments to make room for us for we will make our own bed scented with rose water and patchouli. In this living historical archive, we will document this and all that is held in between. In a state where there are less than 6% of us, we find each other and we plant gardens in each other's chests. We will meet the morning sunrise with a roll call of our loved ones, those who have survived the pandemic, the bullets and the never ending list of isms that threaten to wear us down. We will say his name, George Floyd. Daily, our existence as black bodies and white space is threatened. Yet daily, we lift up our joy, our truths, our voices as an act of resistance. I invite community to pause and bear witness to what some of the leading black voices of our time are saying, feeling and existing at this moment of deep historical transformation. A space where we stand together in mindfulness and emotional liberation, where we process and heal our trauma and green flourishing deliverance, where we wake up and face the sun with hope and cosmic dreaming, where we can still hear our ancestors whispers in our ears where we sing to the babies on the shores of these 10,000 lakes and they hopscotch and dig marble holes in the soft brown dirt, where we are full from auntie's garden blessings and we can rest in hand woven hammocks around dusk, reading these pandemic survival uprising stories to each other. These blue black phoenix rising, making a way when there was none. We thrive in the presence of black, oh, we still hear stories. There is laughter and deep debate, politicking and scribing. There is performance and revival here for art is always at the center. There is remembrance and always there is a moment of silence for George Perry Floyd, for Breonna Taylor, for Philano Castile, for Jamar Clark, for Christopher Burns, for those lost to COVID-19, for mothers who stay up late waiting for daughters and sons who will never return, may your spirits find peace in black space. I invite Shannon to start us up with our first piece and introduction of yourself. Thank you, Shay, that was beautiful. I feel like it really uh, set the tone. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna read um, a piece that I, I wrote actually uh, for the Star Tribune um, to reflect on um, the George Floyd murder and where we're at <clears throat> right now. I always go back to Baldwin and this is Baldwin. Try to imagine how you would feel if you woke up one morning. Oh, that's not good. Sorry about that. Did not know that was there. I always go back to Baldwin. Try to imagine how you would feel if you woke up one morning to find the sun shining and all the stars aflame. You would be frightened because it is out of the order of nature. Any upheaval in the universe is terrifying because it so profoundly attacks one's sense of one's own reality. While the black man has functioned in the white man's world as a fixed star, as an immovable pillar, and as he moves out of his place, heaven and earth are shaken to their foundation. This quote is from The Fire Next Time, James Baldwin's seminal collection of essays on race, power, and politics. It was published in 1962, but might as well have been written yesterday. 
Baldwin's prescient observations about the psychology of American racism have always felt like a revelation to me. A voice from the grave whispering earth shattering truths in my ear that should have been obvious. Even after 60 years, Baldwin's words still managed somehow to occupy the present tense. To have effectively described the roots of white denial and disbelief that not only black people, but much of the nation, including black, brown, indigenous, and even some white folks are just done with the American police state and its relentless destruction of black bodies. That is something else. That is divination. The white hand ringing, what can we do? The images circulating everywhere, more popping up every day, fresh evidence of police abuse against protesters, the growing number of injured or even killed, the carnage of burning buildings and broken windows, and the reliable echoes of that ever loved rhetorical question. But why would they bring such destruction to their own communities? The reclamation of the bad apple argument, the violent white nationalists who always manage to be both well-organized and a complete shock to their fellow white folks sense of reality, infiltrating protests in communities in Minneapolis and beyond, holding rallies in our parks and attempting to burn down libraries and minority owned businesses, our political leadership's profound inability to understand the violence that is unfolding, that has always been with us, but which hasn't had a wellspring big enough from which to burst up till now. Their shock at watching civil society collapse so quickly, the disbelief that this is happening on top of another crisis, COVID-19, the insistence that this virus is more deadly than racism, so protest is a public health hazard. The many past failed attempts at reforming the seemingly intractable police state, the chanting groaning louder and louder. I can't breathe, I can't breathe. All of these are Baldwin stars of flame. Jamar Clark, Philandro Castile, George Floyd, all those ghosts, all those black bodies that were heretofore immovable pillars are now on the move. They walk among us and we among them, the living merging with the dead. They will have their day, they will be heard and their voices are what is shaking heaven and earth to their foundation. Thanks for listening. That's beautiful, Shannon, thank that was you. That wonderful, thank you. Thank you. Um, how would you introduce yourself? Um, I mean, I know that people have access to the bio that's online, but what would you, what do you yourself um, as, a brown bodied person, you know, what, how do you, how do you, what, yeah, what do you want to lift up in your bio? How should I introduce you or you introduce yourself? Um, I would say, I usually just say that I'm a writer, a mama, a teacher and a lover <laughs> um, and a nerd, you know, a big nerd too. Um, yeah. That's probably enough. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So next we will turn it to Denez. All right. Denez Smith. All right. Uh, I'm, I'm still a little caught up in emotions from Shannon's wonderful essay and from the introduction, Shay. So excuse me uh, if I need a moment in one of these poems. Okay, I'm gonna read some poems, y'all. Um, and then I'm gonna get out the way. I'm gonna read two, the poems are short. Um, this first one um, I wrote uh, back in April. Um, these are both the poems of the anthology. Um, so this one I wrote back in April um, when it was only Corona times and not Corona and uprising times. Um, and yeah, I did this on like, I wrote this after uh, me and my partner would take like the same run route um, at different times of the day. Um, and just like have very different thoughts about uh, Lick of the Isles when we were both running through it, uh, which is like not close to me, but is like close enough to run to. Um, and my partner is a visual artist. And so that's like where it kind of starts is like me like looking at their paintings and um, thinking about them. Cool, Lick of the Isles. My love paints graffiti all over the fancy houses in their comics wraps them with monsters, fills them with better people. 
I do not color my hands against the mansions that gingify my sight when I run the water's limit. I don't even think of running up on the houses I run past. I don't run too slow past the neighbors who would call the cops on me if I looked with too much attention looking like myself. This is how the state disrupts me. Pigs patrolling my mirror. The criminal maybe keeps my pace up here through here with uh, not a problem. No, sir. No, sir. Just passing, uh, just passing by just one of the neighborhood brief phenomena man spinning concrete into rent not my father's race but his skin tone attending to someone else's home in the season of distance and the pigeons with the shadows of eagles the squirrels whirling up trees to mid to fight mid sky white people masked in comfort and trust in doctors the dog shit like tiny mountains of dog shit in the cars filled with who they filled with and the cop car just riding through because there's nothing to see here cool um, and then this is called Alive. It's for Kwanzaa's. Kwanzaa's are um, the uh, a Kwanzaa-inspired. Uh, happy Kwanzaa, everybody. Um, all, 20, 365, 366. Um, but Kwanzaa's are little Kwanzaa-inspired poems um, that are each seven. Um, there's a dispute whether it's seven line or seven words per line or seven syllables per line. Um, I liked words, so that's the Google search that I followed um, when I did. This. See, black made that. See that I black made that. That's a black you know, and just like anything black made, there's disputes and also <laughs> about how you do it. Do you put eggs in your mac and cheese? Let's discuss. Exactly. Um, I don't, but I hear some of y'all do. Um, you know, do you like sugar on your grits for some reason? Okay. Oh, I, I won't have it in my house. The kids try to do it. Either. I'm like, no. There's butter. Butter. No, <laughs> there is no sugar in this poem's grits, but there is sugar in my tank. Okay. Hey. Boom. Um, all right. <laughs> Alive. One. Denez, stop acting shook when Black folks are alive. Quit the dream of early kill and sooner dirt, it's no dream. Free them boys caged in those sonnets. You are not warden, not reaper, not the fates, not their damn mama. Alive is a thing we can be too. Look, two. You are not dead and Popeyes is out of spicy. In heaven, they'd never. In heaven, even they biscuits be moist. But heaven ain't yours yet. Them biscuits dry as fuck. So God gave you honey and tea and kisses and lovers who spit in your mouth when asked. Three. The body is the body and inside there's a person. Imagine that. Imagine black devoid of death. Imagine us endless until. If they kill you, they kill you. Until then, they can't touch you, boo. We all die, even God. Don't run from death, let it chase you. Play, four. Three girls play in church outside. Uh, three, pl three girls play in church with a stump for a pool pit, reason enough for today. You a man passing by, auntie trapped in your deacon body. Don't mean to look like danger, but you were born boy. But, uh, but you don't smell like run. Amen, gifted right back. Heaven enough for now. Cool. They're my little poems. Hey. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a wonderful way to start with you, Shannon, and roll right into Denez. Okay, so how would you introduce? Okay, so you, yeah, so you both. So Shannon, I know you were not born in Minnesota, but Denez, you were, you were born. I was, in I was born right here, right here. Uh, I was I, just like many of people, you know, I am a good old Southern transplant by way of my grandmama who great migrated her way up here yeah. uh, and my granddaddy. Yeah, so I was born in St. Paul, Rondo neighborhood. Um, and I think that's how I introduced myself. Like, you know, like the only thing that's always consistent in my bio, my bio at this point, um, my preferred bio was just like, Ness Smith is black and queer and is from St. Paul. And that's all you need to know. About. <laughs> and then right. I'm Googleable, you know, then yeah, I'm, Google, you know, Google. Then, you know my, my resume talks stuff for me, but all I really care about is that, you know, I don't know. I feel very blessed to be from here and to have like got to learn to be an artist here and like to come up under folks like you, Shay. Uh, Cause I think that is like really like the introduction is like, I want to be an artist and, 
and what it means to be a Minneapolis artist and a black men in Minnesotan, I think, which is to make art that um, that is urgent with both its um, protection and its love towards our folks um, here. So that's yeah. all. And I really just want to say I appreciate, you know, Denez, I've, um, you know, of course, read your work, um, you know, your poetry, as well as um, an essay just, just gutted me. Was it in uh, The Atlantic? The one oh, that the you, New Yorker joint? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that one just gutted me. Oh, my God. Like, mm -hmm. in the best way possible. And, um, but it's different when you see somebody read their own work, their you know, work. it's just, it's different. Um, so I really appreciated that. It was, it was really moving. Thank you. Thank it's you. funny that you say that Shannon, because even at my kid's school, they were saying that they had some work, some of your work and they were going to read it in their classes. I'm like, no, get her in here to read it herself. And they were like, <laughs> we will. <laughs> so, oh, what a joy, what a joy. Okay, Jacoby, hey. Hey, hey, hey. Um, so we're going to turn it over to you, Jacoby, uh, for whatever you want to share with us. And I can't help myself, but I, I, will, I may, I know I, I might have lied. I might have to drop some of you guys' bio credits just so, because there may be some random on the line that's just like, I just stumbled on this line and these people are amazing. I don't know who they are. Yeah. So we, I might have to. Um, okay, the, the space is yours, Jacoby. Cool. Um, this is a piece I wrote a couple years back when we got the verdict around um, Philando Castile's murder and we realized that we were again going to be denied justice for that. And I sort of went into a, a long depression, like a three, four month long. I was sort of, you know, acting out in ways that I hadn't before and being a person that I wasn't really proud of. And uh, I was sitting in rehearsal one day for a play I was doing over at the jungle and um, I realized I needed to write some stuff down and exercise this a little bit in order to move on. So this is a piece that I wrote called Where the Fear Comes From. I am trying to love myself more and it's harder than I thought. There are people in my life who tell me I'm worthy of love and I believe them up to a point. The point where I look in the mirror or make a joke nobody laughs at or make a mess of the love I've been given. Those moments amplify and replay in my mind like B-roll of a bad film. But I'm trying to love myself more because I love the world. Even when I hate the world and the world hates me, I love the world. And because I am a part of the world, I am trying to love myself more because I have been loved in my life. Lovers have whispered in my ear, I love you, in the night. They have held my hand in the dark. They have kissed my lips in the rain. And I thought to myself, I wish I loved me the way you love me. I'm trying to love myself more so that I can love someone else without fear that their love might fade, without fear that someone will love them more, without fear that my love isn't big enough or deep enough or real enough. I want to love all the way without half measures or conditions or lies so big that the wall between us can never be broken down or left over. I'm trying to love myself more because my country does not and my people do but with conditions and my family does but we don't discuss it and God does but there are too many to pin down which one and I want my thoughts to be my own and I want to want things and I want to dream in color and I want to feel real, and I want to stand tall, and I want to hear I love you and believe it, fully. And I want my soul to burst open, and I want to show you what's inside, and know that I exist. I'm trying to love myself more, and it's harder than I thought. So yeah, that's that. Hey, <laughs> shay. It's I we've been um e, EG's been showing the boys a lot of documentaries and uh, and I particularly love the learning about the relationship with James Baldwin and Maya Angelou mm -hmm. and and just all of his his interviews where he talks about love and like the process of loving oneself and then falling in love with oneself again and uh, just the way that he talks about it is something that 
it hit a chord in me the first time I heard it. Mm -hmm. um, but so something is resonant uh, in your piece with one of his interviews that I heard. Thank you for that, particularly in a, at a time in our in our nation and our cities where, um, yeah, we have to question how who how we how we're loved, and uh, where where do we get that? Where do we get what we need to fill us up? So we gonna pour into each other in this time. We love you. We love you. Um, I'm gonna just, um, I'm gonna say, and clearly the O'Neill loves you too, as you're a finalist <laughs> this year. So congratulations. Thank I'm you. just giving y'all some, lo some love and shout outs from your bios and Shannon, Minnesota Book Award winnie, winner. Um, your book, Dream Country and See No Color, both are award winners. Uh, Danez um, featured on everything under the sun, including uh, the late uh, the late show, uh, Forbes uh, annual thirty under thirty list. Uh, wow, home your book, homie, and don't call us dead. I mean, just y'all, you guys, black made that. Oh, 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 look what he holding up your hey, what is up? <laughs> hey. the there. That's good. I, That's I good. was on tour once, and this was two years ago, and <clears throat> I don't know where your, your name popped up. And somebody was like, you know, Danez, can you introduce us? And I was like, what? <laughs> so I just love that I, I uh, am friends with important people, um, and not because we get awards, but because our community loves us. Um, so thank y'all. Now we get to the juicy part where we get to interview each other. And these interviews can be whatever, but you know, it's just like, you know, whatever a juicy question is that you want, it can be simple or complex. Um, you know, and Danez, you get ready because you start, you kicking us off. You can ask a question to any one of us. Uh, that's it. And then, okay. you know, then the next person will go. And uh, you guys, you can answer it however you want. So if it's something that you're like, not right now, not in this space, you can, you know, you know how we do that. You can okay. give him, okay. So All right, you're, well, I got a question and I feel like I'm low key looking for advice because <laughs> I have found it extremely difficult to access my creativity. Um, I think in like the whole season of Corona, um, and particularly, I think like um, since like stuff, you know, since the murder, since George Floyd's murder, I think essays have been easier for me because there's still like a thing about information there that kind of feels like I can trust um, or something in prose. Like prose to me is like sort of maybe this is my own bias, but sometimes for me feels like the like lowest stakes for creativity, even though I can be really creative in that space. Um, there's a different kind of allegiance, and so I just have I I think I felt a little bit disconnected from my artist self um, in these times. And so I'm wondering for y'all, um, how have you sort of found yourself keeping that tether tie between you and your artist self? Um, or like, what are your rituals to like bringing that back to you when you feel distant from it? So shoot that interview question to what one person to jump it off. Oh, just one? Question. No, I but- I can't have I, round we table. Can get, we can get a couple in. So who do you, who, who to answer it first? Okay, Shannon, how you feel about that question? I feel like that's a really great question that a lot of people, a lot of creative people are really struggling with, you know? Um, I feel kind of strange, maybe guilty. I don't know. Um, I'm a little, I'm privileged because, um, I'm a professor, I teach at Minneapolis College mm -hmm. and um, I've been able to structure, you know, basically like my paycheck so that um, I can get paid through the summer and I don't have to teach. So um, I spend that time writing mm -hmm. and then um, with my kids, I've got two kids, I'm basically a single mom. And then I've been here in Michigan with my parents um, and they're helping out with childcare, right? That's like, for me, um, for women writers, you know, the, like childcare, I, I was, um, <laughs> I, I love this book. I think he's brilliant. I'm reading um, Ibram X. Kendi, the book that everybody's reading, you know, how to be an anti-racist. Um, 
and uh, it's, it's really good. Um, but I, I was listening to this um, podcast with him and um, it, it's a podcast about writers and their process and everything. And uh, the woman was asking him about, you know, what are the conditions that you need to write and how do you like to do it? And he's like, yes, well, I like to start early in the morning and then go write all day. I laughed so hard. I was like, you will only ever hear that from a male writer. You will never, I don't even care if you don't have, if you're a woman and you don't have kids. No woman writer I know can like write all day. Like, you know, we've got all these community obligations. Right, Shay, I know you know, exactly. You know, so, um, you know, I. those are the kinds of, um, you know, uh, social constraints, cultural constraints that get in the way of, especially my long form writing. I mean, I think first and foremost, I would consider myself a novelist. Um, and so that those, you know, I can write individual essays, I can write individual pieces sort of more piecemeal, but I can't get into like a whole big novel without having blocks of time, like two to three hours. Yeah. Um, and so for me, it's really been about, um, creating the conditions to make that possible, you know? Um, and again, I feel like uh, I'm a lot more privileged than a lot of people because I, I have some options that other people I know for a fact don't, don't have. What, uh, about you, what about you, Jacoby? Do you, have you been writing over the last couple months or did you come to a standstill? Um, you know, toward the beginning uh, when, you know, things were being canceled and we were just, you know, holed up at home, I sort of realized that I needed to get that weight off me, the weight of feeling like I needed to be creative right now. Mm -hmm. um, I had to just let it go. You know, there were so many people um, trying to get things from me and ask for things and, you know, figure out how to respond to the moment. And I realized I just needed to be still and allow it to be what it is so that I can regroup and think about it. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, I think, you know, after the murder of George Floyd, I just realized there was something that sparked in me just in terms of, I'm, you know, very new to the game. I've mostly been acting, you know, career-wise. And, you know, now I'm doing a lot, of more, well, a lot more playwriting and that's very exciting for me. But I realized that I wanted to, I'd been dreaming very small in my life and I wanted to open it up because I was afraid and I didn't know, you know, dreams can be a scary thing because you don't know if they're going to work out. And I realized that, you know, forget all that. I needed to dream out loud and say what I wanted and name it and be specific and not be afraid of it. So, you know, then I just, now I've just been writing and writing and writing and sort of, basically I'm like, when we come out of this, you know, as theater, whenever theater comes back and we do that thing again, I'm like, I'm about to be, words are gonna be my weapons. These pages, this computer, this thing, I'm, I'm ready. And hey, uh, that's what I'm talking about. That's what, I, see? That's, and that, it's that reclamation that I feel what is the excitement that's happening now. I, I, I experienced what you're talking about, uh, Denez, when I had my first child and everybody was like, oh my God, you're gonna be so creative. It's, you're gonna be a mom, you're gonna have a baby inside you and you're gonna be writing. And, and I was just like, when I is didn't, gonna I didn't write anything for I think a year and a half after yes. having my first child. I didn't read a book for a year. That yes. was worse for me. That was worse. See, I read, but I did, I couldn't create my own material. And then I realized um, that I, I cheated. I, so my cheating mechanism is to actually put myself in spaces. And that's what I've done over the last couple months. Put myself in spaces with artists that I admire that I know are teaching a workshop or doing a simple something. And then even if I'm like facilitating, then the exercise I do too. And then I have the makings of a piece. And so there's something about having that prompted space. So um, that really got me going. And then the Playwright Center gave me an opportunity to write a, a piece and that just opened the, the, all of it started pouring out. And I was like, okay. So sometimes we do need to be nudged by other people. Jacoby, you're up for the second question. Ooh, so okay. uh, you can direct a question, an interview question to anyone. Um, and let's see, okay, yeah. So uh, a short, concise question and a short, sure. concise answer. Right. 
I wrote my questions down because I'd be getting nervous when I Oh my God, you prepared. I love it. Okay, yes. here we go. So I have a question for Denez. Um, I just find when reading your work, one of the most exciting things about it for me is just literally the format, the way that the words appear on the page. And as I go from page to page, I don't know what I'm going to get and what participation it's going to require of me as a reader. And so I wonder, my question is, you know, how does that formatting bit come to be? Is that an afterthought or is that very much a part of the process of writing it? Hmm. Um, I wouldn't say it's an afterthought because I think the thing about writing to me is like it's all one big thought or it's like all the amalgamations of the thoughts, right? There are like things that come to you in the first draft and there are things that come to you in the 10th and that's all part of the making of that thing, right? Um, so I would say from poem to poem, um, I would say, I think it's very rare that some of those uh, more graphic decisions are there from jump uh, because normally my first thought is just to get the, the, the poem out, the lyric out. Um, sometimes it comes coupled, but not always. And so that, yeah, so I think some of those shape decisions come part way through the editing of trying to figure out, okay, what is the best body, the best bridge for, between my brain and whoever's gonna read this thing? Um, how do I make that happen? Um, but I really think what I do, like, you know, I love, thank you for that, uh, for that love, but, um, and I do feel like I've, I've dabbled in that, but I feel like I'm like, you know, like Coke Zero compared to like um, the Douglas Kearney's and the Daryl Harris's of the world, folks who are really bringing in that textual ver um, visual art question into the space of poetry. Um, so I think I'm really, what I'm really trying to do it is like kind of a half knack, a nod to um, what they're doing. I think Douglas Kearney for me, um, and thankfully we, we have him here in Minnesota now. Um, but he's the one who really excites me in that way to think about uh, how a poem is a piece of art, you know, um, is is sort of the body uh, remade into words again, you know, in that divine way. Okay, now, Shannon, what you got? What what question is is um, you want to nudge towards somebody? Um, I guess my question would be. All right, I'll ask Shay. What do you feel like is the most exciting or a really, maybe not the most exciting, what is a really exciting um, trait or development that you see in black arts in Minnesota now? And then also, What's kind of like a liability? There's something to be careful of. Oh, I don't know about the liability, but the excitement part, I see, I mean, I just see vibrance. That's a quick, that's an easy one for me. There's something vibrant about uh, the black arts right now. And I mean, I, I, EG said a while ago, he's like, there's a black arts renaissance that's happening here. And the, the thing about it that is re really like, makes me want to jump outside of my bones is, there is uh, permission, you know? And I think Jacoby, you kind of touched on it a little bit. It's like, you know, sometimes when we have that fear that we don't even articulate or even know it's there, it, that thing that's holding us back, we're like, well, I'm not a writer, I'm not, I'm not, you know? And it's like, we sometimes black people feel like we gotta get all the accolades before we can claim the thing. I'm like, you better claim that thing and then move inside that thing fully. And I just love it. It's not just young people either. I see the elders coming up and they're like, I just start writing. I'm, I'm doing some storytelling. Can you listen? I'm like, yes. I mean, literally, you go. I go to places and people are coming with pieces like old school back in the day, Denez. And I'm like, all right. And so I just, that's it. I think there is nothing more special than that. Um, because it's not just about those that, you know, have a certain formality of schooling or whatever. There is a license to get our narratives out there. And I believe we're unstoppable right now. So thank you for that. My question is for all of you guys, but it's a short one. I know we're, we don't have a whole lot of time, but we have enough. Jay Otis Powell bringing his spirit into the room. Um, oh, Jay Otis, hey. hey. <laughs> I'm gonna go, we're gonna go drive and see him um, on Lake Superior in Duluth uh, soon. And just kind of hang out at the beach um, where his ashes were spread. So I'm gonna, my question is simple. It is, um, 
what is the mo what is the best thing about uh, black for you? And a word, a phrase, or a short sentence. I'm gonna start with Jacoby, go to Shannon, and then we're gonna end off with Denez. And don't overthink it either. It should be one to pour out of your mouth. <laughs> uh, best thing about black, cocoa butter. Hey, okay. <laughs> cocoa butter. Um, Shannon, for you, the best thing about black, and however you contextualize that, about being black, the bl color black, all that is black, whatever. Tradition. Tradition, I share. Tradition. Denez, bring us home. Timeless. Outside of time. That's what it really is, yes. Yeah. Outside of the space-time continuum. That's what I mean. Like, you know, like, that's why we always late. It's because I mean, it's like, look, like, I we exist like, we on time. I mean, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. I do. For yeah. me, I think it uh, it is it's truly powerful beyond words. I can't, sometimes I tell the kids, I can't even, you know, they're like, we'll be watching, you know, a documentary and they're like, are you crying? I'm like, yeah, but they're tears of joy. We're just so powerful. We have done so much. And it's, it's a shame that our history, our full history is not taught in this country. Um, but yeah, powerful beyond words. Okay, so we're at the point where we bring the audience in. Um, and audience folks, um, we know you guys are having a good time eating your snacks and you know listening to the good words. <laughs> um, but this, so we have a little space for some questions from the audience. Um, and as a reminder, I think Jeremy made a, a let you know how you can send your questions in. But as a reminder, you can send them to, uh, at pwpwcenter.org. Pw or you can, you, those of you that are watching Facebook, you can put the questions in the comment box under this video. Um, so we'll just see how much time we have. We're gonna end off our, our time with a couple of more interview, just maybe a couple more questions um, and maybe a, a couple of short pieces to close us out. But let's see what the, uh, what questions are, what any questions from the audience. Um, and it could be that you just, you know, you're having fun and you're not, you know, thinking about typing any questions. We can, we'll continue to use the time uh, to love on each other and to share some of this amazing work with you. Um, Julia, all right, great. Uh, the email address is actually questions at pwcenter.org. So uh, you send that to questions, it's spelled out at, at pwcenter.org. Otherwise, you can, those of you that are on Facebook, you can put your questions in the comment box right under the video. All right, so as we prepare for some of those questions, I see a couple coming through. Um, I'm just gonna say, um, Jacoby, I wanna just arm you as time allows, maybe one more question to somebody after we get back and interview, something juicy. Cool. All right, so our first question is from, uh, Michael, and his question is, question from a white writer hoping to responsibly write black characters. Any advice to make sure they respect the characters they are creating? Ooh. Hmm. All right, who wants to take that one? Me. Um, I'll, 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 I can <laughs> <laughs> so Shannon, uh, Sh yeah, so Shannon wants to take that one. And so Shannon, give your, did anybody else want to say something on that one or we'll move to the next one after that? Okay, so Shannon, um, yeah, whatever a concise response would be from you. Okay, so um, that that's, that's a big one to unpack. Um, we could probably have a full hour conversation on that. So I just want to direct you to um, two pieces that you can access um, online. One is by Jacqueline Woodson um, in the Horn Book, and it's called Who Can Tell My Story? Um, you need to read that. And then you need to also read an excellent piece by Alexander Chi uh, that was published in Vulture. Uh, yeah, I see Denez nodding um, uh, last year, maybe a few months ago, but he, he just broke it down. Just Google Alexander Chi Vulture, you know, identity in writing. I don't remember the name of it, but he just goes through and he's like, yo, if you're from the a dominant culture group and you want to write about 
a cultural group outside of yourself that has been historically uh, marginalized, these are the questions that you need to ask. And honestly, and deeply, and here's why. So those are just two resources that I would direct you to. Thank you, Shannon. Um, yeah, I got a lot to say on that, um, but I think you just hit them. I think it's like study up and, um, and read on those. We have a question directly to Denez from Crystal. Um, and the question is, what do you want to see, uh, what do you want to see your accomplices and training do to continue this powerful moment, mo movement's momentum? especially in the sense of intersectionality. So what do you want to see your accomplices and training do to continue this powerful movement's momentum? Ooh. Um, hmm, okay. Uh, I think, I don't know. I really feel like uh, folks are moving in really smart and informed way ways having learned from both elders and ancestors and more recent struggles as well. Um, I don't know if I hope for anything different than what folks are finding themselves putting their energy towards. You know, I think the best lesson for these times is like, um, find your lane and do it well, you know, I think, um, uh, you know, I think we all sort of find where we plug into these moments and I think that's all we can ask ourselves. Um, what do I hope that folks do in terms of intersectionality? I don't know. I don't know if it, I don't know if those people are like my, my peers, you know, I wish like there are black people that I wish like would just like get it through their heads that some of us are queer and trans and I don't really, you know, but I don't know how much I feel like in partnership with those folks and you know, um, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know if I feel like I'm in community with black men who need to like learn that black women matter. You know, um, and I know like in a big sense, that is like who I'm fighting for, who I love. Um, but I don't know if that's a keep doing. I guess I, I guess I, I want folks to um, hold the biggest possibility for freedom and justice as possible in their hearts when they're like thinking about who they're, they're doing this work for. Um, and to really like ever just expand um, who you feel like you're fighting for. And if you feel like uh, you can never look at a group of people and feel like you're fighting for one and not the other, then I don't think you're doing the work right, you know? Um, especially when we're thinking about these Black Lives Matter moments, right? How do Black people matter at every intersection of ourselves and our lives and of our, um, of our need for well-being? In peace. Um, so yeah, so I guess, yeah, ask bigger questions. I guess, yeah, maybe that's what folks can do. Ask bigger questions, ask questions that include more people in your fight. Fantastic. Why don't we direct this next one to uh, you, Jacoby? It's from Aaron. I'm curious about how and if being in Minnesota and the Twin Cities, the setting, the environment, the people inspires or informs your work as Black writers. And also, what is it about Minnesota that has felt like a creative home? So I think those kind of go together mm -hmm. <laughs> and a little bit of like, why do we stay here? <laughs> what is it in Minnesota that is like our creative space, our zone? Mm -hmm. What would you say to that, Jacoby? Yeah, I mean, because I'm up here from Florida. I was born in Florida. I moved up here in 2011. Um, and the thing about this community is, um, especially the Black artist community, is the support and the kindness around each other's work. Uh, I know as, at least as an actor, there's so many times where you get brought into a space and you never are trying to, they're never trying to put you in a play together. They're always trying to get you into that one slot that they have for you that, you know, and there's only one or two, maybe one black man, one black woman, if they even have roles for black women in this play. And the thing that I love is I have found that the actors I've been around, the writers I've been around are very incredibly supportive and they want to see you win. There is not this thing where they're like, you know, I want you to fail so I can succeed. You know, they want everyone to succeed and they want uh, us to be able to actually be learning from each other, not in competition, but to be in a community with each other, to really be together. And so I think that is something that makes this community special. And then also just our ability to do our own work, our ability to uh, gather even in this space and to uh, be in community with each other and to, uh, I don't know, to really just hold each other up and make sure that we good, whether it's in your work or in your personal life. Um, yeah. I, I love it. Um, I think also for me, 
Um, I just, I mean, I, my, I always, my, I found my mentors here and, um, and I just feel like there's an ability of this, of the, these cities to kind of embrace you and take you, you in. You can find some of your people. It might not be a ton. Um, and then the last thing is probably that I feel like I can be my whole self. I, I, I mean, I imagine that I could be myself in other places too, but uh, my experience here, you know, is not like, oh, why are you directing now? Why are you writing plays? Why are you trying to do film? Why are you, you know, it's like, I feel like I grew my arms here and in a space that allows you, you know, there's, it's a garden that has, you know, things move up, make room for you as opposed to there's too many of us here. There's too much, there's too many carrots. You gotta go somewhere else. So um, Shannon and Denez, did you guys want to add anything onto that? Just in terms of what, what, um, yeah, what is about Minnesota that felt like a creative home? I mean, I think it's, you know, I mean, there's a lot of different things. I mean, I, I think, you know, not to get too, you know, I don't know, in the weeds, but I, I mean, I do feel that, that, you know, there is this arts infrastructure here, you know, that is really um, amazing. Um, and that is not present in a lot of other communities um, around the country um, that really keeps people, not just black artists, but you know, artists from all different communities um, here. Um, and I do feel like, I don't know, I, you know, you have this love hate relationship with um, where you're from. You know, I'm a Midwesterner through and through. I'll never live anywhere else. Um, I'm so like the West Coast is like too flighty for me. The East Coast is too mean for me. Like I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm just, and the Midwest pisses me off, right? With the Minnesota pisses me off with the whole, you know, Minnesota nice and all of that stuff. And, but at the same time, it's like, this is the landscape I know. This is the landscape I, I recognize. And I think that there's some things too, when we think about creativity and again, what are the conditions that really make creativity possible and especially allow it to flourish. Sometimes they're the things that you don't expect. Like say, I mean, I'm gonna say something very unpopular here, six months of winter. <laughs> I'm just, you know, like if you're shut in that whole time, right? What are you gonna do? Like, right. I, I do think, and I talk to a lot of artists who talk about how those winter months are really this, this space to sort of, you know, with the season, right? Like go inward, right? And like, you know, uh, a rebirth almost, you know? Um, and, and also how we build community as black people in the winter time. And that's not necessarily for us to tell all y'all out there, but it, we know, you know, and I think that's, there's some special things about how we do come together um, in the winter, but also in crises. You know, and it's like, sure, you know, there's a bunch of things we can uphold as artists and how we've been taken care of, but we also have had to deal with a lot of ish in this in this state. And uh, so there's some connective tissue, some scar tissue that we share in common um, that kind of holds and bond, bonds us together. So, yeah. Denez, anything from you? Can I just add one uh, more thing? Just real yeah. fast. I just want to also say that I think that in the Twin Cities, because we've been whited out for so long and because there's um, these huge other ethnic and cultural communities um, of, of, of writers, um, you know, like New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, it's like, you know, you've got not, you don't just have the Latino writers, right? You've got the Colombian writers over here and the Puerto Rican writers. And it's like, there's so few of us uh, writers of color and indigenous writers here that we really had to bond together to not get whited out in a way that I think makes a very particular form of um, a, of artistic community, BIPOC, uh, Black Indigenous people of color community. Beautiful. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I can say nothing that, um, that y'all haven't really said better. I will say growing up here, and I think this is sort of building on uh, Shannon's point about just there being such a great infrastructure um, to be an artist here, right? Um, there, I, I remember growing up here, there was just a reverence that folks talked about other artists from here with. Um, even in my little like Baptist, you know, like not too far from Mississippi family where like the question was like, what are you gonna do to have a job when you grow up? Um, 
and that was like scared halfway scared of queer people and all this other kind of stuff you know like there was always a sort of reverence that I remember my family and I think it, they learned it in Minnesota that they talked about folks who did work in the community with that that person was a storyteller or a poet or a playwright and that was something you didn't like that you put respect on you know like oh that person is a teacher and we like respect that um and so and I and I and I have found as I started to move out of Minnesota that that maybe was something unique to hear that that we did treat our artists with a certain type of reverence and respect, um, even in the infrastructure, right? That, that to have an artist was a livable dream um, here, you know, and that there was, a, there was a city that was ready to support that dream um, in some ways. Um, not to say that, you know, that we should be like thankful to these grants and all that, but like I am, I feel super blessed to live in a place with so many theaters, um, with so many publishers, with so many folks who are thinking about not only art, but how to feed those artists. Um, and that it, like just growing up in there, I never, I feel lucky to be in Minnesota because it never made me question um, the value of artists, not only in our lives, but in our communities and like in every sector of where we live. Thank you for that. And I'll, I'll just add activists on that too. Artists that are, you know, not just kind of, you know, moving through life, like, you know, the- Oh, that you say something with that, that, yeah. Yeah, I, I actually got down on my knees and, and that was in one of my prayers just this week. Uh, Cause I think that is a, that's a privilege that we're not, you don't, we don't feel like, oh my God, am I the only one that's, you know, um, to be able to have folks that will show up on your back lawn and just talk and we build and plan and then we change stuff. Um, I, there is one more question that slid in, but we won't answer it now. We'll answer it at the end, but just, and it will just maybe reshape it into one, uh, one person. So the question was, uh, aside from the people on this panel, who are the writers or actors or creatives work who you, who inspired, you're inspired by? So maybe just thinking of one person, I know there's a long list for all of us, but maybe it could be one person or it could be somebody right now, you know what I mean? Or somebody once upon a time. Um, so if we can maybe each get that in before we're done. We have about 10 minutes left and um, I, so Jacoby, we kind of put you on deck for another interview question. So maybe you can um, ping that interview question to someone. Uh, we'll keep it, we'll still keep it pretty concise in terms mm -hmm. of the answers. And then, um, yeah, we'll see if we can get just a few more snippets of pieces. I think we might, we're doing good in time. We might actually, um, and, yeah, and you can pass if you, you know, if you want to, but uh, yeah, let's see where we go in terms of time. So Jacoby, you're up. Cool. Uh, my question is for you, Shay. Uh, just thinking about, you know, as you uh, are a change maker and an activist and a, you know, space maker for people, how have you navigated being in um, white, predominantly white spaces, particularly as an actor? What are the sort of things that you do to make sure that you are, you know, navigating that space, but not compromising who you are and what you know your mission to be? Oh, I just show up and I just say Black made that. Just kidding. <laughs> I'm silly. I I um ah uh, that's a good question. I just, honest honestly I just I have to thank my um my ancestors, my grandmother, my aunties that raised me, and uh, they just instilled in us from the very beginning to be be yourself. Mm -hmm. And I know it's so easy. It's much easier said than done. But there was something in that, that when I can't, you know, as I move through life, I just try, I, I really try to push against who I am versus who I'm not. <laughs> and so if I come to those, as I've come to those spaces, and they also instilled in us that we can be anything. Like, so I, you know, I remember my early days. I remember Lori Carlos, who is, may she rest in, um, in peace. But she, she was like, you think you can do everything? And I was like, I can. You know, I was young, but I really thought I could. And I would show up at these auditions. You know, I remember showing up with, at like Weathering Heights or something. And I was like, I'm here for the audition. And they were like, what role? And I was like, any role, any role. You know, we're thinking outside the box, right? So I just kind of can't, so I, that's it. I think I've been privileged to uh, have that kind of upbringing. And that doesn't mean that I'm ignorant of, you know, the energy in the room, the assumptions, the expectations, et cetera. Uh, I try to, I really try to question them, but I also am learning that we are, we are each other's army. And so, you know, sometimes I think in particularly in Minnesota, 
you know, we're meant to still feel like we're the only one or isolated when there's like only two of us. And I'm like, girl, I don't, I don't know you, but let's go on, let's go on <laughs> lunch break. Let's figure out who we are together. Let's talk, you know, talk so we can have some kind of shared experience. And I know we're not monolithic, but it's like pot up. Don't act like you don't see me. I see you, you know. So uh, we be I be potting up real good because I think that we we are each other's armor and army and protection. So thank you for that question. I think it, there's a lot of trauma that a lot of us carry from being in some of those spaces that that uh, can attack us. But we we strong. We powerful. And once you do that enough, people know, like she coming in the room and she herself, and don't try to make her do those random accents, you know, when you didn't talk to her about that and what you trying to do, you know? <laughs> so we're, cause we, we, we come with, with knowledge also, you know what I mean? And I keep telling my kids, you know, you, somebody asks you an ignorant question, you know, come back with them with some of your knowledge and say, what is it that makes you, that makes that question come out of your mouth? You know, mm -hmm. put them, put the question on them. And they're like, well, mom, I wouldn't do that. I'm like, you will when you get older because I'm gonna keep drilling it in your head. So thank you for that. Um, all right, so do we, do you guys have um, another little piece, maybe something to drop or, or does it, okay, so here it's open platform for the last two minutes. So you can either share another little something or you can speak to the last question that's on the docket, which is, uh, a individual or a creative that has inspired you, um, or the, yeah, you're inspired by. Um, or the third option is you can ping a short question, or another interview question to someone in closing. So I will turn it over to Shannon. <laughs> um, I did not have um, another piece. Um... What about your inspiration? Yeah, I have so many inspirations and I feel very fortunate. I'm constantly being inspired by art, artists of all kinds. Um, let's see, um, not a surprise at all. Um, Baldwin is my favorite writer of all time. Um, he, I mean, I'm not gonna say he's the reason why I started writing because I started writing when I was six and you know, you can sort of guess the quality of writing that <laughs> came out when I was six. Um, but uh, I think he, he made me feel so much less alone. He made me feel so much less alone. And just that there's other ways of being, that there were other ways of being black, right? That, that um, yeah, he just opened up so many possibilities to me. Um, so I, I, yeah, I just adore, adore his work. Um, and then, you know, another boring answer, but true is Morrison. I just, <laughs> I don't know what to say. Never be a boring answer. I, mean, I just, it's like, um, yeah. So. Ashe, Ashe. Okay. We got like four minutes left. Uh, Denez. Okay, cool. Um, I really like, I'm gonna do a music answer for folks in Minneapolis. I really have been loving, um, do a Salah's news project. Um, they are incredible. A young genderqueer black, uh, artist doing, um, sort of like Afro funk rock, some shit. I don't know. Their songs make me very horny. Um, and also feel very black. And like, it makes me want to like go to a march and then march straight back to bed. Um, and so um, that's all I can really ask for the work. I've also been um, dipping into um, the uh, the Zulu Zulu slash Astro Black when they changed their name um, archives a lot uh, and enjoying them. Um, yeah, so I've been like really feeling like very blessed by like um, you know, Black Twin Cities musicians lately um, have been blessing my spirit. Um, and it feels like, you know, I don't know. Um, I don't know, we make some good music here. Like everybody like here, it's like, once you become here, like something about all these white, white people in this white, white snow makes you like be extra Black. Um, and so, yeah, so I've been like filling my house with like extra, extra Black music from here. It, it seasons the food more, you know, it's like a cast iron sound. Uh -huh. um, yeah. <laughs> I love it. Jacoby. Uh, yeah, oh, Jacoby. yeah. I I'll say the person I've been 
uh, saying for a couple of weeks now, people ask me what I'm reading, and it's Hanif Abdurraqib. Woo! I mean, he talks about music in a way uh, that I've always felt music, but did not have the language for. When I read his book, Go Ahead in the Rain, about Tribe, I was like, this is everything I've ever wanted to say about Tribe Called Quest, and he captured it. I think he's incredible. And he made me care about Carly Rae Jepsen as an artist, which I did not expect to happen in my life. Um, so Hanif Abdurraki for me. Uh, Jay. Um, I, I always say that I, I receive um, inspiration from the elders and then the little kids. So I love to put myself in little kid spaces because uh, they, give, they give me the juice that I need. Uh, so right now I'm inspired by my own kids who are uh, finding their own artistry, both through drawing and also writing their first little raps. Uh, so I'll just give a shout out to Jordan uh, Vasliki and Jalen Zay. Um, and then I will give another shout out to my mentor, <coughs> Jay Otis Powell, who uh, taught me that uh, there's infinite possibilities. Um, I'm going to close out with just the, the beginning, of, just the very beginning of uh, the piece that I wrote that is on the website that we launched, um, Black MN Voices. For those of you that have just come on, please uh, go to the website, support the project. There's over 55 amazing Black voices um, to lift up. Um, and uh, there's featured works now and they'll continue to rotate. There's uh, upcoming, uh, the Star Tribune has been so excited that they're gonna feature um, artists every single week throughout the rest of the summer and maybe into the fall. Uh, and there's other opportunities that are, artists are gonna be featured as well. Uh, this piece is called Run. 37 days into home quarantine and the walls have closed in and opened and closed again the hysteria of a lack of ventilators, or as Trump calls them, generators, masks, access to healthcare, testing, and just truthful and clear information has been suffocating. Police brutality, homelessness, and unemployment skyrocketing, racist attacks on Asians across the world, the senseless killing of Ahmaud Arbery, tapped out relief aid, funding cuts, and lack of transparency therein, the rise in domestic violence, inequities hyper-defined, challenges of homeschooling, theaters, and places of entertainment closed indefinitely, Zooming becoming the new normal, artists falling through the cracks in just day to day, making ends meet. And of course, there's the death toll numbers, the bodies on ice still awaiting burials and the cases of people who weren't able to have funerals in this time. I have friends in this number whose spirits were unable to get a traditional community send off as many of us are accustomed to. May they rest in peace. I find myself thanking the universe for the gift of prayer. Some days it's all I got to rise up in the morning and get down again on bent knee to meditate and pray for all that has been lost. Most days, this practice is grounding and restorative. It places me in a calm and understanding that allows me to face tomorrow excited about what new can be built out of this rubble. But once in a while, the thoughts and dreams and late night news spin in an unstoppable tornado of mental madness. The darkest what ifs threaten to explode and the walls are closing in ever so slowly, just like in those old movies where the water is rising from below. And then out of nowhere, like a glimmer of neon or light or whatever the hell that thing is that feels like hope in a never ending tunnel of darkness, I realize I'm not alone, that there are others like me. We women of the sun, as my grandmother used to say, sun kissed and blessed with kisses no one like us can ever understand because our past and present and our simple day to day is complicated. Shenge spoke truth, complicated in the ritual of putting simple pen to paper to illustrate the feeling of being brown and black and female and stuck in the belly of a pandemic who's got it out for you and yours, unable to move or yell or holler or break things when the voice inside of you is screaming and shouting and punching the insides of this strangely surreal dank place. You've been swallowed whole without notice or warning or hell, not even that tiny pink note that the job issues to say pack your things and leave. 
There was no time to run, literally none. So you stood in place and looked out at the mess of madness and scrambled for balance, for safety. You searched the faces of your people for answers and like a morning dew falling delicately round sunrise without announcement, there was a quiet peace that light, that glimmer, that neon, your sisters surround you like a blanket of dahlias. There is something ceremonious happening here. Their bodies are soaked in protective oils and they wear nothing but their babies on their backs and around their necks. I cannot see their eyes for they are closed in prayer and chant and silent song. There is union here, kindred, to our ancestors sway and whispers on boats across the Atlantic. One by one, I orbit each of these women straining to witness the wholeness of their prayers. And it goes on. We thank you for joining us today. I just give love and praise to Danette Smith, to Jacoby Johnson, to Shannon Gibney, to all of the other 55 plus artists that are in a moment of silence. We say his name again, George Floyd, uh, and we thank you for being here in this black space. Remember, black made a lot of the things around you. Teach the children, teach the others. Ashe, I'm Shay Cage. I love y'all. Love you. Thank you, Shay. That poem was love beautiful. You. Thank you. Love you. Love you. Good night. Thank you, Playwright Center and and Howl Round. We are signing off. Let's go eat something black, y'all. Yes. Hey. Thank mm -hmm. you.